and gentlemen. <laughs> the last part of today's conference is just before us. Here we have some Blender Guru, some experts, and you can ask them everyone you want, okay? Everything you want. But there is one exception. They do not have to answer, okay? okay. Come on, Tobias. Yes, please, take a seat. If somebody also wants to come here, it's welcome. I can just find another chair for, for such person. But okay, so maybe I begin to, to show some example for you, okay? And some of you can just take voice and answer. And maybe I switch to Polish, okay? But the... <laughs> okay, I know it will help you a lot. <laughs> Bartek. O, dobra. Bartek, będziesz w stanie przetłumaczyć razie czego chłopakom? Jakby coś? Okej, okay, dobra. To moje pytanie jest takie. Jak waszym zdaniem będzie wyglądała przyszłość Blendera w najbliższych 10 latach? Tak. So, um, well, I think uh, such a, such a long uh, term vision uh, I, I I don't have I have no, I have no idea, but um, from uh, from what we know from what has been discussed already, there are some upcoming uh, very important um, upcoming projects that will make Blender become much more powerful and in a way a little bit different than it is now. And this is something that is going to happen maybe in the next year. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot about improvements in the usability of Blender itself. There is, it's time, it's getting time again for uh, another round of uh, updates for making Blender more usable. It is like it looks like it was yesterday since uh, Blender 2.5 with the new 2.5 interface was introduced, but actually it was like three years ago. And uh, there are some some things could be better. And in order to achieve these improvements, uh, some some foundation work has to be done. So like this will mature in the coming year years, and uh, th this will make Blender look and work a little bit different. And then some functionality uh, aspects are gonna change. Probably, I don't know, there is a topic that is mentioned uh, many times. It's about the, uh, the so-called dependency graph. I don't know if everybody, if anybody heard of this, but it's something that will make uh, like a, a new version of this part of the core of Blender will make Blender much more powerful. And we will make it able to handle much more complicated situations. Just a simple example is with the character animation. Right now, if you have one character in Blender, and uh, is being animated, the calculations that have to be done uh, to, to show, to display the animation can be run uh, only on one thread. So if the computer has uh, 16 threads available, it's just going to use one. And if, he has, and if you have two characters, you're still going to use one thread to run this animation. So two characters are going to run on one thread. So you can imagine what happens if you have 10 characters. And um, to change, so it sounds reasonable nowadays to say, well, I have 10, 10 threads, let's give every character one thread. This sounds simple enough. And this is why it's actually very complicated to do in, in such a simple way. And uh, this is something that has been uh, worked on already. Like there are some design discussions and a lot of discussion going on because it's really complicated. And in the coming years, this will actually be realized. I see. And this, is there some plans to involve more people in Blender development or to making a community? Yeah, well, the Blender, the Blender development team, the Blender development community is always open for <laughs> is always open for uh, new developers. If you uh, want to join, you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, so okay, it's working. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. But there are no fixed plans. Like it, it, all, it depends a lot on how much support the Blender Foundation uh, gets from uh, from users. So in this case, it's nice, and I think it's worth mentioning that there is a, something called the Blender Development Fund. Does anyone know about this? So we can pay for Blender. So basically, what you can do is a, a, a subscription, a program where you can do a monthly donation to 
the Blender uh, Foundation so that some developers can be paid uh, per project or even full time to work on Blender. This is a good way for spending money. Yeah, I think you can you can do like it's very flexible. There is a different uh, type of memberships like uh, uh, silver membership is like I think 10 euros per month. Then you have a gold 25. Then you have 50, 100, and 250 is the titanium. Uh, platinum, awesome. So, so, and this is if you think of it, just, just this. If you think of it for 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 a company, this is nothing. If you if you have a company and you have to pay for a for a software license, and you have like three people working there for you, the amount. If you just say, okay, the license is two thousand per year, so you can make a calculation. Okay, it's uh, six thousand because I have three artists. And uh, if you divide this, and uh, you figure out that this is n nothing, and you can uh, you can totally make uh, a subscription, and uh, it's for for Blender. So I think it's an interesting program. You can look it up. It's on Blender.org website. Oh, thank you very much. Some other question, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you was you were first. Okay, so maybe okay. maybe you first. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. More like a discussion or a question. I was nine days ago. I was in London at a post nap event, and it was kind of like a Autodesk um, Hewlett Packard sort of very short event when they were like advertising themselves. But I spoke to one, one Maya guy, a guy that works for Maya. So very very like old school guy, and um, he's told me that's got nothing against the software Blender, but he was telling me that. Blender doesn't have the foundation, the the background to support, like to to actually make like commercial work with it possible, like as as good as, for example, Maya or or 3ds Max. That it's just the the backbone of Blender, apparently. In his in his um, in his opinion, wasn't um, good enough to support it. Well, I didn't know what to answer. I didn't know what to say to him. So if you have any idea what I could say next time I see him. <laughs> when was it? When was it? The, the it was it nine, nine days ago, 23rd, um, 23rd of May in London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I told him. I mean, how? I mean. Sorry. <laughs> well, this is uh, what I wanted to add to what Francesco said, and this maybe doesn't answer your question directly, but um, talking about the future of Blender in 10 years, what I believe is that in 10 years, Blender will be one of the industry standards. This is what I believe, but it will need... Does it work? Uh, it does ah, work. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is what I believe. And uh, now it is still not the industry uh, standard. And the problems are that it's, it's not stable. Blender as such is not stable. It will probably never be stable because of... Maya is not stable. My, yeah, yeah. But the, <laughs> the, point here, the point here is that every day you have like five, six new versions of Blender. Every day. So it's like, you know, when I downloaded, like yesterday, I downloaded the latest version. It's not latest any, any longer, okay? So the problem is that uh, you have to somehow build the workflow around it, and it's not that easy. There are no so many people that know Blender to such extent that they uh, are perceived as professionals. So there are no, not so many people. The, communi the community, the artists that use Blender are perceived as fanboys. And, you know, it's, it can be because of what Blender used to be, okay? Mm -hmm. Blender now is a very pow powerful tool, but some of the, it has, there is no other software out there that is so wide, I mean, so many features just in one package. It is a modeling tool. It's a, for animation, for rendering, for a compositing, editing, and so yeah, so it, yeah, tracking, and everything is packed into one single piece of software. It is built by uh, enthusiasts. Okay, so the people who 
don't do it for, for a living. So sometimes it goes that, okay, some new feature uh, appears and uh, it's great, it's fantastic, but then it's no fun to fix the bugs and so on. So we have several features that are not 100% complete, okay? But anyway, this software can be used to can be used in production in real life to make money. That's true. Yeah. So well, but they can improve it themselves. Studios, if the studio is big enough, and they have a developer and that could develop it. And the it. studios about There's the studios. I, so what what I can tell you about about this? Let's imagine the huge post production studio uh, that has. Uh, all the workflow built around some uh, software, some whatever, Max, have their Maya, own whatever. Okay, so they have their structure. And you may say, well, switch to open source software. It costs you nothing. But in fact, it costs them like millions. I know. Because, you know, yeah. it's switching, it, it's very costly to switch to. To, to change the workflow, to change all of the environment that, that, that the people artists. are working in. It's, and people. And this is like, you know, y y you have, it's like, I am facing this problem all the time when I try to hire the artist. It's not, uh, I, one day I spoke to my partner and, and he asked me, okay, so could you, may, maybe you could, you could hire somebody else uh, some some good artists uh, that can work in Blender, and I said, well, all of the good artists are here already, <laughs> right? So it, it, it was some, something like that. It's 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 not that it's not that it's not that easy. But I believe because right now there are many studios, small studios that that that, that are uh, like uh, building right now. And they have the choice. Blender right now is a very good software. It it didn't, it, it wasn't this way. Uh, I don't know, three, four, five years ago. So now it's a good software, but you know, it 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 needs some time to build the group of people around it. So and you know, many good uh, uh, good uh, pieces have to be have to be created using Blender. And I would like Sebastian to add something to, to this piece of uh, crap that I have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our, I also spoke to the guy, and he was showing showing some features. They don't have dynamic topology sculpting and stuff like that they, in Maya. And I was like so surprised. Like they're, now they edit it, the grease like, pencil, Ooh. and they have grease <laughs> pencil, and uh, and they have like this nose that looks so bad. But that's just another. <laughs> no one uses it. Well, not as not as I mean, maybe the professional one said, but. Um, no, I mean uh, he didn't doesn't know it well enough. I think it doesn't have doesn't get much publicity. Blender doesn't really get that much publicity, and I think there's there's studios, but they don't speak up. And uh, I think the, and they hate us because they think we're fanboys, and <laughs> that's 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 and they just no. don't listen. But it's not true. I mean the support is very good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I think the problem is that. Uh, the, the people in the big studios, they are in their big studio and they are busy because they are in a, they are in a studio, so they are working all day long. They have no idea. There are so many people uh, in, the, in the industry that have just no idea what they are talking about because they only use their stuff. They are in the studios. They are, for example, they are working with Maya 7 or 2000, whatever it's called. Like it's it's old because the new versions are buggy and they are they are not stable and they have to work in their production environment to to keep their projects going. So they just have no idea. And the problem is that <clears throat> the so-called industry standard and the other word is professional that that always drives me crazy because oh it's not professional yeah, why not because you don't pay for it like as soon as you earn money with it you are a professional because you do it for as a profession you earn money and there are a lot of people who are earning money with blender and there's no reason to make a big deal of that because well you do stuff and you sell it and then you're done so what's the matter um no i lost my um <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, while I'm thinking. <laughs> I think the best way to convince um, the world that Blender is a great tool is to teach it to the youth, to the young students, and they they wake up, uh, they grow up with uh, with Blender, and they they uh, they know what Blender can do for them. And um, I was very um, surprised. Um, I attended a course um, in a very high reputed um, school. Um, the school um, 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 teaches um, 3D artists, and um, I attended the course, and and suddenly. Um, they use Blender to teach their students. And, and I was asking, hey, why do you use Blender? I, I thought you have a contract with Autodesk and Maya and all that professional programs. And they told me, yeah, um, we need to teach OSL shaders. And this is not working with the other programs. And it's open, and we can give it to any student, and they can run it on Mac, Linux, and Windows, and it's working everywhere. And so even high reputed schools start to use Blender because it has an advantage. And I think it, it's just the time um, which is needed to, to, um, to make Blender that popular um, in this 3D uh, area. Okay, so the other thing is that uh, there it's often not, uh, Blender is often not recognized as industry standard because the industry is not using it. Because as I've said, they, they are may maybe using Maya 7 or some something. Some are even developing their own tools and don't even think about Maya or Max. They just write their own stuff. Um, and it's not the goal to put Blender into these big studios because I do think that it might be problematic to do Lord of the Rings with Blender. I mean, one thing is that they, they have the money so they can put hundreds and thousands of people to do the work. It's not like uh, they push a button and then Maya does everything. They do it like it's a pain, like, uh, like everything. It's just a pain. You just need the people and the money to do it. Still, um, I would not argue that it might be uh, that Lord of the Rings or what, what other thing like The Hobbit, something might just be too big for Blender because, as I've, as uh, Francesco said, there is the issues with the dependency graph. So, having five orcs fighting 200 whatever is just too much for the for Blender. So, uh, it might be true that Blender cannot do it, but it doesn't have to. Because not everyone is doing The Hobbit or The Avengers. I mean, or yeah, why? I mean, why would you even want to go to Hollywood? There is just a few studios. They are all going bankrupt. They are all having problems. Why would you even want to go there? It's much better to have your own studio, uh, work as a freelancer or in small teams, um, because there's less risk there. You just do. Uh, the things that small studios do, and this is where Blender is perfect, because uh, doing advertisement, you you maybe have a few characters doing some funny things, whatever, um, and Blender is perfectly capable of doing that. Uh, so um, Blender might not be the tool for for the big Hollywood blockbusters, even though it is used there for some tasks <laughs> in some studios, uh, but Blender is much better for for small studios and freelancers and there it's i think this is where it's perfect and that's why i think blender has a very bright future because there will be more of freelancers and more small studios who will be doing cool stuff because they are not depending on giant uh, budgets to just to get the software uh, because they just they are creative people and they start doing cool things and that's this is where blender is perfect uh, okay, I, I have a question uh, because some time ago when I first uh, heard about uh, this wonderful feature in Blender that uh, Cycles will support GPU rendering, uh, I thought uh, that wow, my finally my Fire Pro card will uh, be used for, so for some higher purpose. And uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, and uh, later on I was, oh, I paid a lot of money and I can't use it. Okay, so do you think uh, it will be possible in some, not necessarily the nearest future, but 
uh, in some f- res- reasonably near future to mm. to get it working. Uh, I don't know. So that yes, the, I heard that the problem is f- on the AMD side. Uh, but what what is? Uh, I can tell you the prob the specific yeah. problem <clears throat> which is known is they can't compile. Uh, they can't compile the CUDA uh, drivers um, for for those cards because during the compilation, the compiler takes up so much memory that nobody made uh, a computer available to the developers so that they can actually go through this. They went up to 32 gigs and it still didn't uh, compile. And I think maybe they even tried with 100, I don't know. But uh, the, the problem is that, uh, it, it, that they don't manage to compile it because of this memory issue. The, the issue is known, they talked about it with uh, AMD, but uh, you know it's a big, it's a big uh, corporation, so they have their time. Of course, as Blender gets more and more interesting, that they have, um, they had several exchange exchanges of uh, messages. They they talk to each other, but uh, apparently it's not such a simple issue to fix. Uh, so, hopefully yes, though, because the cards are there. They have a great performance with other type of tools, like with OpenCL. They manage to to get crazy stuff with the ATI cards, so there is no reason to think that okay, unless uh, AMD fails this year, which is something they say every year of AMD in the last three years. Maybe it doesn't happen. So if they keep on pushing, probably they will in in this year. Maybe. Okay. Thanks. Everybody knows that. uh, most of people do the uh, modeling stuff. And some time ago, I had uh, an idea to uh, to start uh, making some, or learning, uh, making uh, some really pro rigs. But uh, I took some time to investigate uh, some, you know, tutorials, anything, and I found nothing. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't mean some simple rigs like uh, making the hand move and stuff like that, but, you know, pro rigs with uh, all the programming stuff and scripting, stuff like that. And my question is, uh, where can I find uh, anything about it? Does anyone does anyone want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I'm just asking. Could I? Could I say a word? <laughs> okay, so maybe you can find this in the future, for example, in Polski Cruz Blendera. <laughs> this is short answer, but it's not satisfactory. But if you would like, you can order some very good tutorials from Nathan Vegdal, who made some things in Sintel and was involved in rigging. Very professional rigging, in my opinion. Okay, Nathan Vegdal, can you agree with this? Yeah, well, because uh, he, he did one tutorial uh, for CMI VFX doing a mammoth rig. So I, I once did a mammoth modeling tutorial, and then I asked Nathan to do uh, the rigging of that. Uh, it's, I think, what, two years old, but it should be still there. So that's about rigging a mammoth. So it's a quadruped uh so yeah. that would be something maybe. It's not for free though, but um, it's it is there. Um, and now <clears throat> then there's one from uh, Lee Salvemini from uh, cgmasters.net. Yeah. He has a um, rigging DVD about uh, the this ninja model that I, I didn't see it, but I think it's very good as well. So there are some rigging tutorials because but uh, but because uh, rigging is maybe not the the most common thing. Of course, there are less tutorials for that. So, I would like to add something to to, to this. Maybe this is not the um, you know, this is any source, but what is important when looking for stuff, for any stuff, for any any uh, learning things, anything to learn from, it is pretty important <laughs> because I've heard many people who say, "Well, I want to rig." Uh, the horse, and I found uh, the rig of the rabbit, so it's not for me. Come on, this is all about techniques. So when we are talking about the mammoth, it, it doesn't mean that, it, that the techniques that don't apply to other models. So this is like, 
something that I wanted to add. <laughs> and uh, just to finish this, um, rigging itself, the, the, the techniques, it, you know, like techniques for rigging, uh, plenty of the techniques are pretty basic. It's like uh, it's like programming, you know, like uh, software programming. They they have not like some, somehow they have something in common. Like a, a programming language has a, a limited set of of structures you can have, a limited set of features you can you can have with the language. But and then it's all about how you program, how you build your your software and uh, how you use those structure to, to make something more complex. And with rigging, is, uh, is quite similar in a way. So you have uh, some basic tools, some basic concepts that then just combined in the right way to the right level of complexity can allow you to achieve almost anything. I think that with Blender you can do really, really complicated things. Like, uh, for example, I mean, Formal learning material, as they, they they pointed out some uh, some stuff, and as they say, most m most of it, most of the learning you can do, you can do it by reverse engineering. Also, how some complex rigging are done. This is very tedious, maybe this is very complicated. But if you want to really do groundbreaking work or uh, to find out really cool stuff, sometimes that's what you have to do because. The alternative is maybe to go to uh, and have one-on-one -on -one training with a trainer, and then he's going to teach you the most advanced things, whatever you want. But if you take the quad bot rig from uh, Tears of Steel, it has something like 720 bones and uh, deformations of all sorts and pieces that can come and go. It, it's it's a um, it's not an organic model. It's a robot, but basically anything that you find in that, in that robot, like all the all the knowledge, all the, the work that Jeremy put in when rigging that that model, and if you take also the robot hand, if you combine those two and the stuff that is in there, you can build a, a, a transformers, for example. It's basically the techniques are the same, like uh, uh, driven animation, uh, chains, switches, and uh, some other stuff, and then it's just a uh, complexity. So yeah, I don't want to blabber too long. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> you already uh, have I, my I have maybe one question. Is it possible uh, to to make Blender using a swap? I mean the the virtual RAM or something like this during render? Because uh, Blender Blender quits when 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 the RAM memory is 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 uh, full. Uh, is full. Yeah. Is it possible to? to Are you sure? <laughs> like I mean, it depends on how much swap you have. But in theory, Blender can render up till the end of but swap. Then, then yeah, when, but when but the swap yeah, is I, over, I mean, I mean cycles maybe especially. Ah, yeah. Well, okay. no. Um, I think. I think you have, I'm not super sure, but uh, you may have uh, problems, for example, when you render with GPU and you run out of memory yes. on GPU. Okay, in that case, there is no such thing as a swap for GPU memory, so you cannot do it. That's the limitation of rendering with GPU. It's okay. exactly that. Otherwise, we would use GPU all the time. For example, in Tears of Steel, we had to render, well, most of the shots we had a render farm, so it wasn't GPU-based, it was CPU-based. But the reason why we didn't switch to a GPU-based, potentially more uh, performing and potentially cheaper, is exactly this, that the maximum amount of memory available at the time was three, six gigs, and we had some scenes that took up to eight, yes. and in that case it wasn't yes. working. So it, uh, I, I, I heard uh, from, from Blender Guru, from Andrew Price, he told about the cycles and rendering, yeah. and he, uh, he told that even if you have two or three graphic cards, Blender uses only the, the memory of one graphic card. And not of the three combined together. It can, it cannot. So it's going to adapt, and it's gonna uh, use a par. You can use parallel computing with graphic cards, but it's very important that they are as similar as possible because, uh, in case they are different, uh, cycle the, the the kernel, the 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 the, the CUDA yes. drivers, and all that machine that dispatches the calculation is going to take as a as a base the weakest, the crappiest card you have, and is going. To, okay, this card has a uh, 216 uh, CUDA cores, so it can run 216 uh, micro threads, and it has uh, 200 uh, megs of RAM, and then you have a GTX uh, 580 with three gigs of RAM, and then it's going to be like having two crappy ones. So that's how it works. So when they are uh, uh, um, exactly the same, yes, 
Blender combines the RAM of, of both? No. It, it always stays as uh, the one. one. So if they are identical, it's just going to be okay. as one. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mm, I don't have the question, but I would like to add something to this GPU uh, conversation. Uh, this is not my knowledge. I'm just saying something that I heard from a person who has a lot, uh, who knows a lot uh, than, than me. Uh, Scotty, may, maybe some of you remember him from Bendlerovnia a few years ago. He's a, a rendering engine programmer, and he said that CUDA actually um, avail is available to transfer to stream data uh, while rendering from hard drive to the GPU memory. But the PCI uh, express limitation is so big that uh, it totally destroys the performance and it will be uh, much faster to render it on CPU. The limitation is the PCI because it's, it's uh, slow, slow. Cool. Okay, do you agree? I have no idea. We, <laughs> if a developer tells us you cannot do it, first time you say okay, because you believe. Then like the second time you say okay. And then like if you start hearing someone else saying yeah, but then maybe the developer is lying to you. <laughs> but okay. in this case, I mean, it's a, okay. there is no, I mean, it, it's fine. It sounds possible. So. It could be bottleneck because you can uh, sub data too often, for example. If you would like to calculate something in GPU entirely, you probably go very fast. But if you have to download this to the main RAM of PC, you have to put this B by this PCI Express slot. If you do this often, you lose your speed. Yeah. I tested this with matrix multiplication, for example. And I managed to write a program for GPU who calculates two times slower than GPU. <laughs> Not so great, I, I know. <laughs> Good job, I know. <laughs> Next question. Well, there were some um, some questions about some more um, complex stuff, but I would like to ask something about very simple, basic things. Because, uh, well, I'm in a graphic department, and um, there's some uh, kind of a joke there. Uh, when you first time uh, enter the Blender and actually open the program, uh, how you crashed it, or how you actually made something strange with the interface, and how you couldn't uh, get anything work, and you're uh, totally crazy about what's going on on the screen. So, um, as um, when you get to the 2D programs, like for example, Game, for example, Adobe Phot Photoshop, yes, Illustrator, anything, there are somehow more, um, um, you can move it f um, more like um, intuitive, yes, very, uh, they are more easy to get into very fast. So there are more people getting into those uh, softwares. Do you think the 3D um, softwares, where they are, of course, more complex, they are like a combines to do stuffs, but uh, do you think they should be more approachable? And is it possible to do it? <laughs> This is not entirely serious, but I think there there's a like a, a barrier so that the idiots stay out of Blender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean the the what have I done? No, the thing is that if you if you make it too simple, then the 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 usability will suffer because you then you have to have a button there that's. Uh, <laughs> And then you have to press it, and then then it's uh, and you have to make the button in the interface. You you cannot simply move it around. Uh, maybe if if it's really a button with a with an icon, for example, I don't know. It's just more. It's more like why would you do it? I mean, it's not you. I we uh, we don't need more Blender users. We need more. We need better Blender users who make better bug reports, who uh, donate more to the development fund. But we don't need more. More morons, for example. We need more. We need better Blender users. What about? I don't think when looking at Blender 2.6 something, Blender 2.5, and so on. I don't think it's not that user friendly. It's it is user friendly right now. It's more user friendly than the previous versions. How many of you? Uh, started working in Blender 2.3 something or 2.4 something and so on. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, 
Back then, I think that everybody remembers this, that when you downloaded Blender for the first time, I think everybody remembers this, this, this moment. <laughs> when you open it, when you open it for the first time, when it's Blender 2.37 or Blender 2.40 or something like that, you open it and you see this square and nothing more there and you try to do something about it. You don't even see that it's a 3D program because everything is flat, okay? <laughs> and you try to simply select this, this, <laughs> and, you, and you, simply, you simply click and only this, this circle, <laughs> this circle just moves and, and you cannot do anything with this. <laughs> <laughs> Moving circle, yeah, and it's and it's fantastic, and you know, and it's like, and you try to and you try to find anything in the net that will tell you anything about this program, and you go to the wiki page, right? And this wiki page tells you nothing. No, 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 no wait. <laughs> it That's one thing. It, the first thing you learn is the gingerbread man. Yeah. Did you, did you do that. Yeah. 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 Oh. That, that, oh. Yeah. That, that's yeah. That's what yeah. you find. So yeah. it's like, uh, and you use the right mouse button <laughs> to select the object. And this is like uh, I remember falling asleep. But he he was he's a genius. He's a genius. But he was the only one who created tutorials back then. What are you talking about? Ah, gray, gray, yeah, gray. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was the only source of any knowledge, and it was. But now, when you have Blender 2.5, 2.6, you simply download it. You have several, I don't know, several web pages, and the knowledge is out there. It's 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 so simple. Back then, it was it was really disaster. So 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 so. Now this interface looks more. You know. For the first time, when, when, when Blender 2.5 appeared, I hated this because I got used to Blender 2.4 something. But, well, for, okay, the other people around who use, uh, uh, like, other programs uh, who are used to uh, hit Control A to select everything, and I got used to simply hit A, not Control A. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's obvious that in order to save the file, you hit Control W, right? <laughs> how it works in Blender. And to select something, you use the right mouse button. It's, it's obvious for me, but not for yeah. <laughs> normal human being. <laughs> no. So, well. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, that's great answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he has a... Should I bring you the microphone? Ah, <laughs> oh, he has a... Ja powiem po polsku, to w sumie tak. E, od jakiegoś czasu mamy w Blenderze Python Notes i jak myślicie, czy Blender e, pójdzie w stronę tworzenia proceduralnego, e, jak Houdini albo e, Ice w Soft Image? For some time we have the Python Notes and uh, how do you think uh, it will Blender go uh, in the path of uh, to 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 Procedural creation? I don't know how. It... So I have. <coughs> I don't know how the Python notes work, but Lucas. I have no idea about Ice and Houdini, but uh, I just know that Lucas, the uh, one of the guy or the main guy who's working on the node interface, he's working on something like this. At least I know that he's working on um, modifier nodes and and particle nodes. So he wants to make uh, the. He wants to make it easier to, to combine several things through nodes because the modifier stack that we have right now is nice, but it's also limited. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but apart from that, I don't know. I think it would be that there are experiments, but um, there is no roadmap to that. Yes, we go fully procedural. I can. Uh, everything will be nodes, but. I can tell you something exclusive. But wow. No, no, I am joking. But uh, <laughs> um, I think uh, almost one year ago, I was using this uh, <coughs> the branch from uh, Lucas Lucas Turner. That's uh, his name, and uh, for uh, um, particle nodes. And um, 
it's it it was a proof of concept, but that uh, he's definitely working on it. He spent the last months working on the Pi nodes and on refactoring the n node groups. So he's been very busy with that. But uh, he said that like maybe this year uh, he will release something. He is mostly working alone on this because there isn't much, you know, he cannot even work full time on it. He's one of the, of the developers who benefits from time to time of the Blender Development Fund. If the Blender Development Fund would be twice, he would probably be able to work on it uh, part time regularly or even full time. But uh, at the moment it's not possible. And since he's also uh, studying, he, he cannot follow the, the project so much. So that's one of the reasons why we don't have it yet. But there is definitely something going on there. <laughs> Another question in regards to the future of Blender. Uh, as we heard uh, recently, GIMP is trying to get ready to, to jump into nodes. And also, uh, they are rapidly working other other parts of uh, open source uh, programming in the entire world. So uh, if we could uh, somehow find a way to, to connect the Blender entirely seamlessly, maybe there would be in a future possible to, to do things that we can not, even cannot imagine now. So the question is, what happens, if anything at all, in regards to, to cooperation with, uh, with uh, developers of other open source programming? I cannot really answer, but I, I do it anyway. Uh, so there's, I think currently the only thing that we have is the Python API, uh, and even that is apparently hard enough to maintain stable. So uh, other developers from other programs, uh, for example, Synthize, they have to uh, provide scripts so that they can export with their proprietary software to the Blender API thing. So the you know what API is, you do, right? Okay, so uh, so the, the Blender API has to be stable and always the same. But still, it, it changes from time to time, so even that is uh, hard to maintain. So in, in, if now I think that uh, Blender has to work together with the GIMP and to keep on working, that is such an effort that personally I don't see that coming, but I have no idea, so... Uh, can I just wanted to add <clears throat> something very briefly? I think what you're talking about is more about the joining forces of different open source projects to yes. to, to to provide this, a better. This and uh, one thing: if we could have a, a pipeline that works seamlessly, that we we could not even uh, uh, percept the, the the jumping from one software into another. Yeah, 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 it would be uh, something from the space. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, um, seamless and pipeline don't um, cannot go in the same sentence. But uh, <laughs> that's actually why you have a, a pipeline, like uh, to 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 make stuff go from one place to another. And usually, you have to work very hard to make it go from one place to another. But um, just to quickly talk about the um, open this open pipeline concept. Nowadays, it's already uh, possible to, to make something like that. Like uh, if you have a, a GIMP file, like the other day in a IRC, like uh, th there was a, some discussion about, OK, supporting natively the uh, GIMP format or so, some other uh, uh, open, open raster. Let's support open raster in Blender. This means adding a library where the specification of the open raster format is uh, is um, is defined, and then you can make it available in Blender. Um, so basically, having in, in integration is uh, somehow possible. Sometimes not even too hard. But the main problem to me that I want to go back to is really the communication, the synergy that doesn't exist at the moment, or doesn't yeah, it doesn't really exist. I think between uh, uh, different open source projects. Uh, that's because uh, open source projects are very unique and they tend to be um, islands. They don't uh, talk to each other very much. This is part of the nature of open source and uh, it, it's due to uh, several factors. And uh, mostly these are limitation. I think Blender uh, has been lately and always uh, marked as one of the most prominent open source uh, projects, of course, from people who know the open source movement, because Blender is not so wide known, but 
people who know about uh, about software and people in the free software foundation for example blender is uh, highly regarded as a as an open source project and there are not many other softwares that are up to that level because if you even think um i, I don't want to say anything bad about the gimp but their development schedule uh, the, 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 the way the, the, uh, I'm, I'm not a, um, a um, seasoned GIMP user, so maybe I'm even saying wrong stuff, but I follow the GIMP development sometimes. I see that they have a different pace than Blender because they have a different user base. They have different use, they, they, they made different choices. They don't have open, uh, movie projects. Like that's something that uh, Blender does, but that's also because it's a different software. So. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's in a way, it's about this uh, situation. It's a more uh, sociological thing about open source software. And on the practical side, like having the super smooth uh, ideal pipeline is something that can happen slowly, but it, there is no unique solution for a project. So that's why you actually build pipelines because uh, it's easier to maintain separate tools and then have somehow a glue that puts them together according to your needs. I would also like to add something. So one thing that I wanted to mention, because I think the idea of yours uh, was something, is it possible to create the tool that combines everything that is out there, right? Like, or, okay, or work with everything. Yeah, but this is like uh, creating something that does everything. So it was an idea even, because now in Blender we have so many stuff packed into it that there even was an idea that maybe it would be better to create like separate programs for several tasks but well so so and uh, when when talking about seamless working take a look at what happens inside for example adobe take photoshop and after effects very similar programs somebody even says that after effects is a photoshop but it's moving okay yeah. photoshop but in time and take a look at the keyboard shortcuts are they the same the the software is from the same company but the keyboard shortcuts are different you work different in those applications you switch between photoshop and after effects and you have a very different feeling about what you're doing so expecting having seamless workflow around the softwares and so on i think it's too much this is. Thank you. I have some other kind of a question for every of you. Do you are you planning for some new cool training DVDs? <laughs> Especially starting with Sebastian. No. <laughs> Ooh. Maybe, but uh, see, he's there's... changing his mind on <laughs> No, there's nothing, nothing scheduled. I just did one, but it's a German one, so uh, uh, I don't really feel like doing another DVD very soon. But then there, there, I, I hear that Kier and Sergey might meet in the summer in Amsterdam eventually, and they might do some cool stuff. So if they and do some more interesting tracking things there might be in the need for another hmm. dvd but i don't know uh, so currently there's nothing scheduled thanks and i would also like to add something to this uh, because of the speed of development of blender it's a it's really a, a problem to make a dvd series because uh, as you can imagine, if you create a DVD series that is like, uh, I don't know, six, seven hours of training, it requires time to think about it, to plan it and to record this. I have some experience in this. I, I have uh, created only one series of, of, of this kind. But, you know, because uh, this is for most of us, it's, it's a like uh, using our free time to do it. Okay, everybody has to pay bills, so we are working. And uh, when I have only Saturdays or uh, evenings to record something, it takes like uh, okay, it, it took me to it, it took me about five months to record the series of tutorials. 
And how much time? Half a year. It's a huge amount of time in terms of development of Blender. So when my DVD series was published, it's already outdated because the first uh, videos were recorded like uh, two versions ago. So this yes, is as, as long as I remember, the Sebastian's f first DVD about that mammoth was even from the 2.4 version. Uh, you uh, saw that? Uh, <laughs> oh my sure. god. Good. I watched it recently uh, and then I had to stop it. It was so horrible. No, but, it was perfect. <laughs> no, but but he's he's right. That's even, really a pr even uh, the uh, first time lapse I've seen of yours with the fly. <laughs> I ah, just memories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious where you uh, swapped to much moving uh, of out of modeling. Well, currently, I'm going. I'm getting back to modeling. Um, <laughs> Match moving is nice because you just press buttons and something works, and that's awesome. just because I'm lazy. <laughs> uh, no, but, but here it's, it's really a problem for the uh, not only tutorials but documentation. Uh, it's changing so fast, uh, especially with the release cycle of two months. That's yeah. it's almost impossible to do anything. Uh, so this, the last DVD that I did was uh, I did it in. Uh, January and February and I had two weeks um, I had to go to this publisher in Germany and they they had the microphone I had to just sit there for two weeks and record the DVD so that was two weeks and in these two weeks there were so many changes um, that I had to record another tutorial in the very end to say okay so you're going you're about to watch the dvd but there are some things that changed already uh so i apologize um because i will be talking about sample as lamp um but now it's uh, multiple important sampling uh and and stuff like that and that's really really a problem at least for for me or for us because you cannot do it after the release because then you are doing something for an outdated Pro uh, program, uh, so you have to do it right before the release, uh, but you have to also take the time to record everything. So you are probably doing it in the middle of the development for the new release, and it's it's, it's almost impossible to to do something that is up to date, um, that is not changing during the recording of the DVD. So that's just. One reason why it's hard to do tutorials or DVDs. So it's so it's simply easier to to focus on one specific topic, something that you can record in one day. Simply record this, publish this. It's up to date, and you're done. And then make another tutorial about something else. And but creating series, creating DVDs or so, yeah, it's difficult because of this. I would like to add uh, something to it. Um, I would recommend to watch and 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 read tutorials which are not specific, made for Blender. Yeah. Uh, read tutorials that are made for 3ds Max or Maya, and you will learn something about the concepts. This will help you more than if you just learn how to uh, press which key, because the concept um, stays longer up to date, or it, it, it lives longer than just to know which key you have to press. And um, there's a publication in England, it's uh, a magazine, it's called 3D Artist, and um, I think it's uh, it comes out every two weeks or so, and um, it has a lot of uh, tutorials there, and, and I love it to read how to make it, and this, it's not about Blender yet, it's about uh, 3ds Max and Cinema 4D, yeah, this guy, this guy has one oh. copy, so um, go ahead to him and, and, and just uh, look into it, it's very interesting. Ah, yeah, the actual version is is purely about Blender. Yeah, so that's so great. Uh, it's a, it's a great thing. Articles. Yeah. You want to add something? You. All right. I'll add something. I haven't said anything yet, but uh, obviously, I mean, when you have tutorials, the more basic it is, the less relevant the version is. I mean, if you go back to like 2.49, you could extrude a cube, and that's amazing, and it still works. Yeah. You know, and then you say, like, sample is lamp or whatever. I mean, yeah, that changes. So, I mean, what are you trying to learn to do? Are you trying to learn how to um, model an animal generally? I mean, what are the yeah. steps? What's the process? Sure, you can go back as far as you want, and that's still good. Uh, but what specific series of buttons do you now push that you did not push before? I mean, it's true, and you get crazy. Yeah. 
And I mean, I've gotten like halfway through recording like a 14 hour tutorial or something. And I'm like, okay, that's crap. <laughs> and it's gone. Yeah. But, uh, or, or to some extent or another. So uh, it was probably an obvious thing to say, but I hadn't said anything. So it was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the, this the, was Chris Kuhn, who is going to talk tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so th those are, uh, for example, though th there are tutorials that are not uh, software specific, they they're teaching some some stuff generally, like, like yeah, modeling or, or or something. I remember one thing: uh, how did I learn, for example, about um, Euler rotation problems? Who is the animator? If someone is the animator, uh, you know what I'm talking about. I learned about this specific problem from the tutorial that was, it, it, it didn't, uh, the, the, the guy who recorded this didn't even open any software. He simply described the problem, okay, using the graphs and so on. And this is how I understood this, right? So this is, um, and it's also the uh, some some of the advice for us who is are recording Re, uh, just, just just do tutorials on mm. on general things. just do drawings yeah yeah <laughs> draw things draw things <laughs> Um, I, I just uh, just to uh, wrap this up, I wanted to add uh, one thing. So, based on what everybody said, to me it looks like there are two types of um, tutorials. Um, there is or, or, or contents. Like one one type of content is really about a technique, and uh, an, an, another type of content is about the the workflow itself. The workflow can change, uh, like the practical workflow, um, but uh, the, the the technique, the approach that you have is uh, is still the same. And it's very hard to make tutorials that are only about the uh, about the the, the, um, the concept, like okay, how how you how you do modeling, how does modeling work? And uh, but I think it's still possible for for the other uh, type of content, which is like the very how how do I stay on the bleeding edge? How do I use the very latest technology? How do I really like keep up to date daily? Um, I think this is something that uh, uh, suits very well, um, uh, that can suit very well uh, professionals, especially because if you are a, just a, a hobbyist user, you don't, I mean, unless it's your hobby to stay up to date with the very latest development of Blender, but that's quite, quite time consuming. If you are just a hobbyist, you can just uh, once every three months, two months, get the latest version of Blender, read up the logs and uh, check it out. And, and that is going to work fine for you. And instead, if you need it professionally and you're really up for it, I think it's not going to be the, the type of content that should exist is not tutorials anymore. It's rather do good quality documentation itself or uh, support. And this means that uh, uh, there are people around that follow Blender development very closely, not necessarily developers, but like uh, experienced users who just keep up to date with Blender. And uh, it's it's going to be them that can probably um, produce, provide this content. And this is uh, something that I think uh, very, uh, it's it's not so easy, so easy to have this content for free. So this is something that uh, uh, if we are going to want or need more of that, it's going to be something that should be paid. And uh, there has been some discussion already, especially for the wiki documentation, uh, that uh, is sometimes up out of date uh, or that it's uh, hard to maintain or many things. But that's because it's a very hard, a very difficult task and it needs dedicated people and uh, their dedicated time. And this is not something that uh, someone can do for free all the time. So. This is just just to make a distinction of the of the two types. Then this is my opinion, of course. But I think in the future, this is uh, I hope this second type of content will grow more because this will lead to a better quality of uh, the Blender experience for professional users. Okay, one more question. Well, my my remark uh, concerning. Uh, the, the problems in software in statistics, for instance. Uh, if you uh, deal with uh, the software in statistics, you have background in statistics and you choose uh, 
uh, open sources on uh, just buy it. So I think this uh, the similar situation is uh, here. I'm not specialist in this field, but I just feel like this. Your last word uh, uh, was uh, background is the mo mo most important in this, and this is the uh, the place of my question and my interest in in this conference. Uh, my son just uh, uh, invited me to, uh, but uh, in fact I I. Uh, I have uh, looked for uh, how to corporate, uh, in fact, in mathematics, just uh, such stuff like like the um, uh, modeling, the uh, the procedural modeling. Uh, for instance, it's uh, because you said that, uh, uh, but it's on the university with the art or something else. But what is the uh, important part of your background it's uh, you can just uh, uh, give me uh, the imagination give me the what's most important uh, uh, and, and some uh, lectures was just uh, re, uh, uh, we, we called it uh, in, in uh, it was uh, in the lecture of the mappings charts uh, manifolds perhaps on the exotic spheres uh, who knows and uh, on the other hand we have just the uh, uh, some uh, problems in approximation theory because uh, it was just the um, uh, normal uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, many stuffs just appear for instance in mathematics but uh, if you uh, have opportunity to put at the university the blender which is uh, cli uh, quite normal uh, for instance R, the program R, have you heard about this as a program of the statistics okay. uh, we uh, we teach it at the university. We teach the other programs of software in statistics. Where you you have such opportunity? Imagine. So, in what kind of university you have just uh, put the blender? I mean, the teaching of blender. So, this is the uh, what you said. The, the most important is background. So it's, what is the background of of uh, of this imagination? In fact. So. Can I? Uh, so I'm, I'm not super sure I understood, but uh, I, I wanted to say something by hearing what you were saying. I think that uh, the background is indeed the most important thing. If you are um, if you are a, a user of uh, other software, but with the background, I mean, having the background is the most important thing, together with something else, uh, the the will to adapt or to 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 change your tool. And uh, uh, because you can be a experienced uh, any other 3D software user, and then you can, if you if you have the will to 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 change, uh, then you can do it much more easily than learning from scratch. But if that was not what you were meaning, it was more like how you how you learn this, uh, how you learn the the concepts, not really how you learn the tools. I mean, that doesn't really matter because uh, some the concepts are there, but you need to go through them with the tool somehow. So if you can start with Blender, I think uh, it's better, but it doesn't really matter what you use. The, the learning curve, the learning curve for uh, the 3D uh, animation is, uh, is quite steep anyway. So uh, there are benefits in having a higher, uh, in a, a steeper curve, because then you will be more proficient in the short run, uh, but it takes a lot of effort at the very beginning. So. I think all in all, I don't know. Okay, so are there some more questions? We can afford, I think, uh, at most one. Maybe, okay. Oh. You have an answer, oh, okay. yeah? You. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, so I, I try to, to, to put a blender on, on the University of Hanover. And this guy told me, uh, I know him, but, but he told me he's, he's a Cinema 4D user, and he told me I tried to do something by only what I what I get out was uh, where, where, where crappy photos or something like this. And yeah, it's it's very hard because they the they universities I don't know they they. They paid less licenses for 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 Autodesk or something like they this. Free licenses. Yeah, free licenses, and they are they they stick to to the professional software, and maybe they they don't want to use Commercial Blender. Software. I don't I don't really know. It's 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 <laughs> tricky. Uh, 
it's not true, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I know something about the wavelets and about modeling in wavelets, the picture, the, the uh, but <laughs> the modeling, it's just uh, the, the different stuff, you know. So maybe I can say that I incorporate Bender already at the University of Gdańsk. And I think this is a very successful process because I can teach students not only regular 3D modeling, for example, such, such things like artistic stuff, which are nothing to do with science, for example. But I can teach students also how to program in Python, for example, how to think in 3D, how to do mathematics, for example. And well, quite basic one, of course. Maybe not that advanced things with you know topology or something like that, but there is still a possibility, even in uh, lower schools, not at university. And there is a very wide open area in, for example, simulations and in you know, visualizations. If you can visualize in 3D some scientific process, this is also involved in science. So Blender is a very good tool for this. Of course, it requires some work to achieve some goals. There is an add-on for Blender. It calls ODS Studio, and uh, they are doing calculations about wind, about yeah, about a volumetric flow, and something like this um, um, with other open source software like OpenFoam, and uh, maybe you you look an uh, in, in, in internet. Uh, just a remark, I think it uh, depends on the lecturer at the university. Um, if uh, he or she is uh, familiar with Blender, sh then she or he will teach Blender. And if it's not, then they take something else. So um, for my case, I teach um, Blender in two universities in, in uh, Mannheim, and it, it, it works very well. And um, what's uh, great uh, in Blender is um, the Python API, and you can just plug anything um, to Blender and, and make it uh, and make it visible. So um, there's no uh, there's no specific discipline where Blender is restricted to. Okay, I said that there could be one more question, but I wonder if we have time for this. Are you going or maybe I can say this in Polish because I'm a bit tired now. So how to say this in Polish? <laughs> <laughs> Okej. Okay. Czy jeszcze jedno pytanie wytrzymacie, czy kończymy już teraz? Okay, so one more question and this will be the real last one, okay? And we have to close this session. Say thank you and there will be another part, okay? But I can say this in a moment. One more question? Anybody? Maybe you have asked something. Okay. Uh, could you say, say something about the new uh, movie in Blender Institute? And uh, what kind of improvements are uh, planned, and uh, what kind of movie it would be? <clears throat> At the moment, like a few months ago, uh, Tom Rosendahl announced the name of this new open movie project, the Gooseberry Open Movie Project. Not much has been said about it, but uh, what we know is that it's going to be a uh, um, feature film. This means like uh, 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 80 minutes, maybe 90 minutes of uh, computer animation. And uh, it's going to be realized by uh, different uh, studios. Um, a, a set of studios spread across the world who are going to work together to, uh, to produce one feature length film. So this is what has been announced so far about the project. And uh, probably at the end of this year, some more formal announcement and uh, more uh, planning will be announced. W sumie chciałem zadać to samo pytanie, ale <laughs> w takie, jeżeli mam okazję, co, czy są jakieś plany jakiekolwiek na temat nowego projektu otwartej gry? Are there any plans, uh... 
Yeah, so, so far n nothing has been announced and nothing is planned by the Blender Institute. Nobody and no one is forbidding anyone to do an open game project. Somehow it seems like uh, it's an exclusive of the Blender uh, Institute, but uh, nothing is forbidding any person with uh, some uh, management skills and the production skills to set up a facility uh, and get some funding to make an open movie, open game uh, project. Uh, the only examples that is going to be quite successful to my knowledge, maybe there are also other, but like one prominent project is going to be the Tube Open Movie project, which has been going on for uh, more than a couple of years. Uh, in the meantime, the Blender Institute uh, has done two open movies, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is the result in the end, and I think it's going to be really great. So besides that, uh, to my knowledge, there isn't much comparable, but... It's really, uh, I, I can't, I mean, I, I can explain myself why, but at the same time, it's a pity that we don't see more of this, so. Okay, so this session is over. Here is uh, Tobias Gunter, Chris Kuhn, Francesco Cidi, Vatex Kogopa, and Sebastian Kuni. Thank, Thank you very much.